Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hope everyone has some coffee. <laughs> um, I'm here to discuss paraprofessionals and aides in the IEP. Um, I, many of you know me by now. I'm Audrey Vernick. I'm the Director of Educational Advocacy and Training for the Brain Recovery Project. Um, and I am very honored to have Courtney Cohn with me today. Am I saying your last name right? Kane. Kane. Well, what? You know, this is the thing about the English language that I hate. <laughs> Courtney Kane. I've, I've never had, had to say your last name till now. So Courtney is a, um, a paraprofessional that worked with one of our families for the past five years and two years in the school district as her one-to-one -one aide, which is a miracle of miracles. So do not think this is the norm. Um, and she graciously agreed to be here today to kind of talk about her real-time experiences kind of on the ground, supporting a child with hemispherectomy and kind of the, some of the issues with the school district. And Courtney is also ABA and floor time DIR, DIR trained. And I think you're working on a master's degree. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, well, well, we'll save that for later. All right, so never assume anything. And I start here because my takeaway message, if there's anything you walk out of the room with today, it will be if you think you know what the para support is in the IEP, the way it's written in the IEP, you are probably wrong. So, um, there's a lot of parents that are in the position of asking for a one-to-one -one aid for their child without really understanding what that means. And I want to explain today, my role is to explain how you're going to get that, <laughs> um, what it is and what, what, how you will get it. But um, oftentimes what ends up happening is the team agrees to a paraprofessional support. And it's written in the IEP that the child has paraprofessional support. So if the child's IEP says, um, Alexis has paraprofessional support, period. What does, does anyone, what would you think that would mean? Anyone raise your hand, tell me what you think that means. Sorry? All the time. All the time. Does it say all the time? No. Okay, anything else that, that you think that might mean? Alexis has paraprofessional support. Does it say that? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. What do you think? If it did, it would mean that there has to be someone available in the classroom to support if needed. How often? All the time? Often. How many kids is that para going to support? Mm -hmm. Okay, so you see where I'm going here, right? Yeah. I'm not trying to put any of you on the spot. What I see all the time is the parent thinks their child has paraprofessional support. And then they drop in to drop off a letter at the office or pick up a you know, lunch, or drop off lunch that the child forgot or something, and they peek in the classroom, and there's no para in there. And they, they get all freaked out. Why, where's the para support? I have para support, we have para support. It's like, no, what does the IEP say? And then it, they send me the IEP, I'm like, para, the child has paraprofessional support, period. All that means is that there is a paraprofessional available somewhere in the school building, sometimes, maybe whenever, at the will and whim of the school, right? Doesn't mean anything. So I'm gonna tell you what it needs to say and how, you, and how, how to get that. So we all know that after some epilepsy surgeries, especially the bigger ones like the hemispherectomies, multilobe resections, the child might require a one-to-one -one dedicated aid. I've already used a word you didn't hear before, right? Um, or support across all school settings for several years or maybe forever throughout their educational career. Uh, I think, you know, I, I know people are here probably because you're interested in paras, and I'm going to talk to you about the hows and whys, but I also want to emphasize there are deficits to having a para as well. So I'm going to talk about both sides. Um, and our kids will often have behavior issues or other needs that require them to have that additional support, um, like the vision, the auditory, sensory, attention issues, et cetera. We want to be careful also that paras are supporting needs that they are qualified to support because the other issue I often see is paras end, end up becoming the child's teacher. And we'll talk about qual para qualifications. Um, all right, so what is a para? Um, there's a million terms out there for para. And so your district may have different terms. There's really only one term that I want to see in your IEP. I want it to say dedicated one-to-one -one aid slash or paraprofessional or dedicated adult support. And then I'd also like it to say, depending on the needs of your child, but if, you, if this is what the child needs, I'd like it to say throughout the school day, across settings, to include transitions, recess, field trips, bathroom breaks. You see where I'm going? 
You want to spell out every possible scenario. And then you also want to have a backup plan. What happens when the para goes to lunch? What happens when the para is sick? Does your child get to go to school? Do they get to go on that field trip? Et cetera. You get the idea. So it could be many names. You want that dedicated adult support. This is, in my previous presentation, I covered um, comprehensive evaluation, which I'm going to reference a couple times today. So we know now from that presentation, if you weren't there, I'm going I'm to clue you all in. Can the doctor write a letter saying um, Johnny needs a one-to-one -one aid at school? No. So what does the assessment say that says that Johnny needs an aid at school? So the doctor can write a letter raising the concern and um, triggering an evaluation, but they can't, there's no doctor's note for a one-to-one. -one. If the IEP team determines that that support can't be addressed um, adequately without a one-to-one -one dedicated para, then they have to usually refer out to their central office because there's usually not an extra body being paid full time to be there waiting to serve your child. So this is a process. It's not going to happen overnight. And then you want to really think about your areas of, of concern. What, what needs does the child have that the para would support? My guess is most of you could jot down a list now of about 20 things without trying too hard. So if you haven't, write that list before you go into the meeting. Don't go in. Don't assume anything. Remember the first thing, never assume anything. They're not, don't assume they're going to know. Well, of course they're going to know that my child only uses one hand, so he can't zip and button his pants after he goes to the bathroom. They're going to know that, right? Those kinds of things. Never assume anything. Um, there is some legal language, and we have a document on our website. This is from that document. I question the veracity of this statement. <laughs> it, it compares paraprofessionals and aides. Um, in, I, in IDEA, which is the federal law, there is nothing that truly defines the qualifications of paraprofessionals. There are staffing requirements, not really para requirements. The ones that are in here I will show you. But in No Child Left Behind, which became ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, which supports low-performing schools or Title I schools, there are specific requirements written because those, those schools are receiving, receiving additional federal funds. So I believe, I may be wrong, that this distinction between paraprofessional and aides is only in those low-performing Title I schools. You will know if you're at a Title I school. Usually there are schools that have 50% or more free and reduced lunch. They tend to be the inner city schools. My kids went to both, uh, Title I schools because we're in San Francisco and almost all the schools are. Um, so here's the definition from ESSA, which is that No Child Left Behind uh, it was an add-on kind of guidance to the states. It's not binding because it's not a legal mandate, but it kind of sort of supplements IDEA, which is the federal law. So this is a, a paraprofessional is an individual who is employed in a school under the supervision of a certified or licensed teacher. So that includes people employed in language instruction, special education, migrant education. So not all, it doesn't all apply. Just to give you an idea, this is an overwhelming slide. I'm not, I don't want you to feel like you need to take this all in. This is from the Texas Para Guidance document, which is 190 pages long. And this is one slide, and they have three tiers of educational aids. So each state will have their own requirements about aids. Look at your state. Go, go to your state's website and find out what are, what is there any language around what a paraprofessional should be, what qualifications they should have, et cetera. So then what are the qualifications? Um, this is under No Child Left Behind slash ESSA. It's now ESSA. I'm saying No Child Left Behind because that's what I grew up with and it's familiar to me. It's the state guidance, uh, gu guidance to states about some of these things. So this might only apply to Title I schools, but I'm going to give it to you as a reference. So they have to meet applicable, app, applicable state certification and licensure requirements. I believe that under IDEA that is true of all paras. Courtney, what do you think? Did you have to do any kind of a licensing or certification or anything before you started working in the school as a para um, with a child? I didn't. Um, my title Yeah, you have to
Yeah, so sometimes the requirement is it might be a test that the school designs, like a paper and pencil test. They're usually pretty basic. Um, be qualified to perform the particular duties needed to implement a student's IEP. This is really important. This is the bulk of what we want to get to. Um, and then if the provider qualifications are a central component to ensuring your child's appropriate education, they should be written into the IEP. So. If you're looking primarily for someone to provide health support and can, and can administer CPR, that's not just any para that graduated from high school and took a paper and pencil test, right? That's a specific type of training. And so I have a friend whose son is profoundly deaf and he, his aide has to be fluent in sign language. So the district has to hire a signing person to work with this child. You can't put a person who speaks in sign language with a para that can't communicate with them. Pretty basic. Maybe this person has a language impairment to the point that they need a really a credentialed specialist in language to be that paraprofessional to act as sort of like a language translator. Um, a behavior analyst. This is a big one. So a lot of people want paras because of behavior issues. Their child is not regulated well, especially after um, epilepsy surgery, even epilepsy and medications themselves can affect behavior. But do you want just a para? Do you want just a body sitting next to the child, following them around? Or do you want them to have some training in behavior? Again, these are based on the assessments and in the discussions with the team, what is appropriate for the child? Um, any other, any other qualifications that might, that might be needed? This is California's paraprofessional para requirements. I'm just showing it as an example. Again, look at your state. Um, in California, you have to have one of these, either a high school diploma, two years of college, or an AA degree, and then pass that paper and tencil, pencil test. That's it. So for a, a child who has half a brain, maybe is still having seizures, maybe needs medication, needs help with toileting, needs social scaffolding support, you get the idea, right? That's not enough. So this is the base, 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 base requirement. So then there's the role. Um, this really depends on the child, and it's, it's, this is where you define the need, and, and you define the need with those comprehensive evaluations that help tell the team what the child needs and what the recommendations are. So these are the instructional support duties that paraprofessionals are able to perform. Um, the, so tutoring, if tutoring is scheduled when the student would not receive instruction from the teacher, classroom management, computer instruction, parent involvement, instructional support in the library or media, acting as a translator, and providing instructional support services. This is generally a school para, like a school slash classroom para. This is gonna be a different kind of role than what you're seeing with what most of you, I would assume, are looking for more of a dedicated para, right? Um, when the para is providing services required by the IEP, they have to do it under the supervision of a special ed teacher. So if there is no teacher in the room, like if, I don't know how this was, I would be really curious in Chicago, she's, uh, Courtney's in Chicago, um, if the teacher ever stepped out of the room and asked you to like finish the lesson or monitor the class or, did that ever happen? No, it was, it was a room. Okay, so there are always two teachers, okay, okay. So the tech, I mean, we see this a lot where paras, the teacher will be like, oh, I'm gonna run down the hall to grab something from the principal's office. You manage all the children. And there's one child's dedicated para. And I know this because this is what happened with my son. He had a dedicated para. And you know, I would say every day he would come home with a story like, oh, it was really fun when Mr. Diego was running the class. Or you know, whatever, like I would, I would find all this out. So the teacher needs to be in the room. They're not allowed to give, provide instruction. They can, they can, Reinforce instruction if the teacher plans the instructional activities. The teacher is the one evaluating the achievement, and the para has to be in close and frequent physical proximity. So I had this issue with a client where um, the child required direct instruction in reading because their needs, reading needs were greater than the typical classroom. They actually required a different intervention than what was being offered in the special day class. It was determined that that was appropriate. And they wanted the child to go down the hall with a para who had high school degree, no special education, not a teacher, and do a special, highly specialized reading intervention three times a week for 30 minutes. That's what they were offering. And th that would violate this, right? You can't, that's not appropriate. So is the para having close, um, the, the teachers planning the instruction, evaluating the achievement, and working closely with the teacher, physical proximity, it says it right here. 
So this begs the question, what is Specially Designed Instruction, or SDI? Um, the IDEA, the federal regulations, define special education as specially designed instruction at no cost to parents to meet the unique needs of a child with a disability. So let's break it down a little bit. Special education is more than providing accommodations or assisting a student with assignments. Um, a lot of students eligible for special education need some accommodations to access the general education environment, but a pro providing those accommodations or academic support doesn't equate with specially designed instruction. So this is the language here on the left side from the law. Adapting as appropriate to the needs of an el eligible child under this part, which is uh, under the IDEA, the content. So what's the content? The content is the classwork. Is it going to be modified? The methodology, is it the appropriate curriculum for the child based on their reading level or whatever needs they have? Um, or delivery of instruction. So does, is it the right setting? Is it the right person delivering the instruction to address the unique needs of the child that result from the disability and to ensure access of the child to the general curriculum so that the child can meet the educational standards within that apply to all school children within that school district. So this is graduating with a real diploma. On the other side of the screen, you'll see things like intensive academic re remediation. Parents like to call it tutoring. In the IDEA, it's called one-to-one -one instruction, or a specific methodology, like Orton Gillingham or Linda Mood Bala reading instruction. Um, this is what specially designed instruction is. This is not what paras are qualified to do necessarily. Behavior therapy, such as 40 hours of ABA training a week, um, and then a variety of settings, including the home. So that's where special, what specially designed instruction is and where it would occur. SEI is what makes special education special. You have a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the slides, yes. So all the slides are on SCED okay. on my, at my presentation. If you okay. click on it underneath, I, I uploaded it. I could only put 10 documents there. So my presentation is there and some handouts, including um, Alexis's um, para document, my son's para document, which is like the training document that we would hand to a para. All the materials are there. So you can just take cursory notes. It's also being recorded. So if you want to come back to it with a cup of coffee, and the printed out document. I didn't want to print stuff out because it's just um, unwieldy. And I apologize. It's a lot of information to try to squeeze in. I just have one question. Sure. Going along there. If, if the school system doesn't meet that specifically designed information that you're putting down about your child, is that specifically designed instruction? Okay, so we'll back up like three presentations to IEP basics, and I'm not no, no, I'm not dismissing this at all because it's this is a complicated process and it's important. And I wish I could go into detail on everything. We tried to break things down into chunks to make it more manageable, but let me just tell you that there are procedural safeguards that are provided to every family at the beginning of every IEP meeting. It's required by law. If they didn't, they've already had a violation. You should read them and know what they include. If they if there's disagreement about what's being provided in the IEP, like the child requires something, it's documented and the school just won't do it, you have a due process violation, you're hiring an attorney and you're filing for due process. If it's in the IEP and the school district is not implementing it, then it's a state complaint. A state complaint is the easiest thing in the world to file. You print out a form online, you attach a copy of the IEP, it's a one pager. You submit it to the, your State Department of Education. School districts hate them. There is no cost to the family. And at some point, you have to be the parent that bites because if they will know who they can walk all over and who they can't. So there may be a point where you decide. I, I have actually said to directors of special education, including my own about a month ago, I would hate to have to file a complaint on this. So, and my son received $5,000 of compensatory speech therapy services that he missed this past school year when I said that to the director of special education, which he was entitled to, but had I not said that, would I have received that check? No. So you have to know your procedural safeguards. They're complicated, it's a lot, and I don't, I can't for the purposes of this, but there is a set of, of parameters that need to be followed. So, all right, I'm gonna move on. Special SDI makes special education special. What does the teacher do to present information that's different? This is by the teacher, not the student. So sometimes we'll hear, well, the student's not working hard enough on their SDIs. 
That's not the SDI is what the teacher does, not what the student does, based on the skills the student needs. Um, it's not content standards. It's it's what is the unique teacher instruction written on the IEP that will be provi provided to the students. And that's in order for the child to meet their goals. So the goals also have to be good. And we could spend four hours right now just talking about goals. We haven't even touched on that. So it's all part of this process. So can paraprofessionals provide SDI? They can provide reinforcement and continued practice and support of assignments once instruction has been delivered, but not original instruction. The team of the regular and special education teacher are writing and designing the SDI. And I'm going to look at Courtney and say, in your experience, because you were in a co-taught classroom with Alexis, with a, a regular and special education teacher, did you feel that they were designing the SDI and then you were supporting it in an implementation? Or how did that work for you in real time? Okay, so their teacher was designing the curriculum and you were, okay, that's exactly what should happen. <laughs> um, the para can provide additional supports um, in individual or group activities. Um, the other thing to note is SDI is not about things like getting homework done or having an extra person in the room just in case something might happen, which again is what we see often. Um, the school will say, well, we have a homework uh we have our homework support period at the end of the day. The kid can go to that to get their SDI. That's not SDI. It's not specially designed. So the other thing I'm going to point out here is the language of the IDEA is very clear and very specific. And if you are willing to print out and read the IDEA, it might take you five years to get through it, but over the next five years, take it to a little bit at a time. The language is specific for a reason because it has to be upheld by the law. So when it says specially designed instruction, that's what it means. And anything that is not specially designed is not SDI. And then they're not getting special education, because remember, SDI is special education. Um, it involves, it does involve accommodations and modifications, however. So sometimes the school will say the SDI is the accommodation. And we've been back and forth about this, because I don't personally think S, an accommodation is, is, is instruction. The law does. So again, we're going back to IDEA. What does IDEA say? Accommodations and modifications are do fall under SDI. I don't think our children should have just accommodations and modifications. They do require that specially designed instruction. But you know, again, we could spend an hour talking just about <laughs> just about SDI. Quick question. Yeah. Does that affect the content or the amount of content that's being taught? The SDI. Um, does it affect the content or the amount of content being taught? Can I just give you an example? Yes. When I taught and I taught inclusion, we had a, a, a child that the mom wanted us to cut the amount of vocabulary words he had to learn compared to the rest of the class. And we could do that, but the problem was at the end of the year, the state test he took was exactly the same as everybody else. So expecting yeah. I hear what you're saying. I think that's a really long conversation that we, we could have. And I, I hear what you're asking. Um, a mod, a, an accommodation is something like um, the child needs a slant board so that they can have the paper at the right angle or they need a wiggle band on their chair. Yeah, or something like that, or they need materials covered for their vision or that kind of thing. A modification is anything that changes the curriculum significantly. Once you're modifying curriculum, you do go down a slippery slope of not being able to pass state standardized testing and getting off a diploma track. And that can happen very early. Um, That's what we were trying to tell the mom. Yeah, yeah. On the other hand, for my own son, for example, he would get a worksheet with 30 math problems, you know, little tiny like the rows and rows and rows, really impossible for a kid with the visual impairments that he has. He's great at math. So we insisted that he get a math worksheet with nine that were representative of, of the, what he needed to know, and he did fine on that. And he was, you know, so then there's also the question of whether or not you opt out for standardized testing, but that's another, that's another, uh, assess, another session. Okay, um, so here are other tasks that the paras will perform. 
um, toileting assistance, implementing a behavior plan, facilitating and scaffolding social skills strategies and social relationships, sensory um, issues, um, some educational tasks like note taking for the child is in the domain of a para, monitoring safety. There might be clerical work like go run down the hall and enlarge this math worksheet for this child with a visual impairment so there's only nine problems on the page. The teacher might circle the nine she wants and the para runs down and does that. As long as it's not a dedicated para because where does the dedicated para need to be unless she's taking the kid to the office with her to do the copying someone else has to go um, assist the student with lifting transferring positioning etc so for kids that are more impaired and need physical um, supports again what does the IEP say is it very specific you want to be very clear accompany the student on community outings and field trips I had a mom come up to me after the last session and say my son requires a nurse because he is having active seizures and it has to, he has to receive diastat. And in our state, only a nurse can give diastat and he has a one-to-one -one aid. And they went on a field trip and there was no nurse. The nurse was sick, so my kid could not go on the field trip. So that's denying the child FAPE or free and appropriate public education right away. Your kid might need both a nurse and a one-to-one -one aid full time. If that's the need of the child that the team decides and that's what's provided. Um, supporting the child in all the related services. This was an issue that came up um, with Alexis that we talked about. Um, they would assume that, you know, like, oh, Courtney can have her break when Alexis is in PT. Does she not need behavioral support or vision guidance or auditory support anymore when she's in therapy? No, she still needs the support, right? So again, what does the IEP say? Does the IEP say the para will attend the child to all of their therapy sessions? Or maybe only specific ones. Maybe the child does great in one-on-one -on -one speech therapy, but in group, they need the para because of behavior, right? Maybe, you know, it just, it, again, you just want to really think these things through. And then all those transitions, recess, breaks, and lunch. Because I often see paras, I had a child with significant behavior issues that I was working with, and the para always took his break at recess and lunch. The kid was melting down at recess and lunch. They had a sub para that knew nothing about the kid and it was just a disaster. So again, spell it out, be very clear. And again, these are the things a para cannot do, develop the lessons plans, it, you know, new content, administering tests, direct teach, developing IEP goals and objectives, classroom management system. They can't design the BIP. They can inter in implement a BIP, which is a behavior intervention plan. They can't design it, assigning grades, determining or reporting student progress, any IEP-related responsibilities without the supervision of a certified special education teacher, or serve as a substitute teacher, even for PE or an elective. And I see this all the time. So there's a para. Teacher's got to go have her coffee or make a phone call or talk to a parent, right? And the teachers are strapped. I get it. I was a teacher for 13 years. But they are not certified teachers. I have seen schools where they have non-certified teachers come in and teach some of these classes. And they figure, well, we've got a, an adult in there and a para, we're good. It's illegal. They're not allowed to do that. And why does this matter? Because if something happens with your child, you want someone who's gone through all the procedural safeguards about what to do in an emergency, what do you do in a fire drill, what happens if there's an earthquake, and the visiting artist and the paraprofessional might not have that skill set. So training. The state must establish and maintain qualifications to ensure the personnel necessary to implement the IDEA requirements and are appropriately and adequately prepared and trained. This is the entire language from the law. It's two sentences. And this includes making sure those personnel have the content, knowledge, and skills to serve children with disabilities. So this is all that IDEA says. And remember I said very specific language. So does the personnel have the content, knowledge, and the skills to serve the child with the disabilities? What I often see is we do so much professional development at this school. We don't need to do any more. You, don't, you do not understand how many trainings our paras go to. They've been to crisis protection, prevention, and they've been to literacy interventions. And they're doing this social emotional foundation thing that's so great, it's going to be really helpful. Does any of that relate to your child? Maybe, but most likely not. I have, um, there was a child with hemispherectomy that I was working with, had a right hemispherectomy. The para didn't really understand the vision impairment, and so that they sent the para to their district's vision training. The vision trainer did not know what hemianopia was. So was that vision training appropriate? Did it help in any way? No. So again, very specific. So if your IEP says the para will receive training to support the child, period, 
this is a training. They got training to support the child, right? This will support the child, but it's not specific. So you want to be super, super, super specific. That's the language. I read that to you already. Um, and again, those paraprofessionals and assistants have to be appropriately trained and supervised. <clears throat> So again, what is appropriately trained? It has to be specific to your child's needs. Is it medical support, toileting, behavioral, social skills, et cetera? The other thing that I often see is the para doesn't know anything about the child's IEP. So I have worked with many families where the para hasn't read the IEP. And I'll say, it's really interesting. Why haven't you read the IEP? Oh, I'm not allowed. The school will say, oh, that's confidential. Only the IEP, the teachers are allowed to read that. That's, we don't let the paras read the IEPs. That's not allowed. So <laughs> the, the para, as much as anyone else, and there are problems with the teachers and the principals in this as well. Not, it's not their fault. So I want to be very clear. I'm not placing blame. But there's a lack of training on this. Um, as to understanding that the IEP is a legal plan written by the IEP team that documents the priorities for the student for the school year. My son's first principal had come out of UC Berkeley's principal training school the year before, which is this touted program in California. And I said these words to her, did you know that the IEP is a legal document that commits the school to provide these services for my child? There was a long silence. So she had just finished a two-year grad program. She was a certified teacher. She had been a special educator. She just finished this principal training. She did not know that it was a legally binding document. So this is missed so many places and the paras are at the bottom of the food chain unfortunately in the school district courtney's smiling over there and nodding her head i'm sorry to say but they're almost the most important kid that's with your if they're the most important person who is with your kid all day so i think as parents what we want to do is make sure the paras know as much as possible if you need to write i'll say well let me sign a release then so the para can read the iep document or I will provide a summary, which we have a couple examples here of summaries of key points that we feel paras really need to know. There's something called an IEP at a glance. Not every state has it, but some states do. I will print that out and give it to the para. It generally includes the reason for the IEP, kind of the, what, what is the disability, the goals, and the accommodations. And the para, the para needs to know these things. So the, the school just can't say, well, that's confidential. We don't do that. All right, and then they also need to know that everything within the document is confidential. So it's not like because we're giving it to the para, now the cafeteria workers and the bus driver and everyone else gets to read it. You are entitled to decide who gets this information. Choose wisely and pick and choose who is going to get what information. Yes? How do you respond to school administration that doesn't allow, doesn't allow the para to attend IEPs or communicate directly with the para? I think I have a slide in here about this. If I don't, I will remind me at the end to come back to this because it's a really important point. OK, so how can you make your case for a dedicated one-to-one -one aid? I said in my last presentation I was going to say these words over and over and over again, and I'm saying them again. Assessment in all areas of suspected disability. And again, the comprehensive evaluation looking at all the areas of potential need. The evaluation has to be sufficiently comprehensive to identify all of the child's special education and related services needs, whether or not commonly linked to the disability category in which the child has been classified. Why does this matter for a para? Well, you can think if all these things that, that might influence, you've had that checklist at the very beginning, I asked you to jot down the ways where you think your child has needs throughout the day. What mommy wants doesn't matter. You don't get to come in and say, I know that my kid needs help with A, B, and C, so you need to provide a para to do it. The assessments need to say that. So your key, generally, to the paraprofessional is the functional behavior um, assessment. If you have not had a functional behavior assessment, your child has behavior issues, and that's the primary reason you're requesting a one-to-one -one aid, then you need a functional behavior assessment. A functional behavior assessment looks at the function of the behavior with ABC data antecedent behavior consequence. So that means that why is the child running out of the room screaming or hitting other kids? What happened right before that? So that you can develop a behavior intervention plan. Who is going to implement the behavior intervention plan? A paraprofessional. Because a teacher cannot have 22 kids in her class and one that freaks out every time someone sits too close to her and because the child is still learning uh, spatial awareness and social skills, et cetera, that's where you get that paraprofessional support. 
So I'm going to give you some examples of some of the ways. I actually am not going to read these slides, and I'm going to go really fast so far I have time for questions because these are all in the PowerPoint that I uploaded because there is a lot. And we have a guide which Kylie was supposed to print copies of. I think they might be at the desk. So if you want to get our um, the, the ways, this is all listed in a specific guide about paraprofessional support as well. So vision, um, many, many ways in which vision can be supported. This would be designed with a vision teacher, right? What supports does the child need? The team can't make the decision about what supports your child needs without that appropriate evaluation and without the input of a vision teacher. Safety and mobility, again, um, there might be a vision impairment, there might be an orthopedic impairment. Safety could be that the child's impulsive. So is the child gonna run out into the street? You know, there, what, what are the things that might be, um, does the child have difficulty participating in PE or recess? Is it safe for them to run across the yard when there's a lot of kids on the yard? That sort of thing. Helping with devices and that sort of thing. Um, that bilateral function, which is all the, you know, everything our children with hemiparesis can't do without support. Uh, that, that might be some of the ways in which the para might help. Social emotional. Again, I think this is where I would argue if your child needs social and emotional support in the school that you need training, you need an aid that is trained in some of these social emotional skills because providing this kind of support to a child with a brain injury and epilepsy and who's been on seizure meds is a sophisticated thing. It is not easy. It's often hard even for very skilled clinicians to support in this way. Instructional support, again, appropriate instructional support, not the instructional support they're not allowed to do. So again, here are some things that they might do. Uh, auditory processing and attention. So every child after temporal lobectomy or disconnection, hemispherectomy, will have an auditory processing disorder. You just have to determine the extent and severity of the disorder. Primarily what we see is that in a classroom setting, which is a dichotic or multi-sound, multi-speaker babble or multi-sound environment, it's a very challenging environment for our kids, so that auditory processing evaluation needs to take place so that we can determine what supports they might need. These are all from my son's um, auditory processing evaluation. These are the recommendations of the audiologist. That ADHD attention and behavior, um, what are all the different supports there? At the bottom, I have collecting that ABC data. I talked about that antecedent behavior consequence. I have a lot of kids that have beautiful BIPs, these behavior intervention plans. They have a para, and so we go to the meeting and we're talking about the behavior intervention plan and progress, and oh, they're doing great. Well, where's the data? You know, they don't have anyone to collect the data. That can be something the para can do. Again, there's a lot of stuff here. You might need more than one person to be supporting this child, and I do see that. Um, there are times where we have a nurse, a full-time nurse, and a full-time aide, and then a behaviorist, a behavior technician is coming in two, three times a week to collect behavior data for the IEP. So that is not unusual. Uh, filling out that communication log, these were um, from Courtney, making sure the accommodations are provided, ensuring that there's a daily visual schedule. A lot of our kids require very specific um, structured information about what's happening. They don't like transitions, they don't like change, so the para can be supporting that with a visual schedule because the teacher's not gonna have time to do this. So you're thinking about all those things, 22 kids in the class or 26 or 30, however many it is in your district, who's gonna do all this? Writing out the schedules, preparing the child, et cetera. So I'm gonna talk just briefly about least restrictive environment. This is also in the law, which says to the maximum, maximum extent appropriate children with disabilities are educated with children who are not disabled, Se special classes, separate schooling, or other removal of children with disabilities from regular educational environment occurs only when the nature or severity of the disability of a student is such that education in regular classes with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactor satisfactorily. So LRE, or Least Restrictive Environment, is one of the kind of tenets of, the, of IDEA. It's a very important thing. If you want your child to be in general education with a para, LRE trumps a lot of other parts of IDEA. So I don't know if this might be a good time to talk a little bit about inclusion. Um, Alexis, who Courtney supports in the school, is um, you know fairly severely impaired and has a lot of deficits, is behind academically to her peers for the most part. Am I saying anything incorrect? But her parents felt really strongly that inclusion was important, especially in the early years, and they, ar they argued that that was the least restrictive environment 
and that with a para, which would be an appropriate support, that that would be the appropriate setting for her, and they got it, and a lot of families do. Um, and, and the other thing is the district is obligated not only to provide your child special education, they're actually by law required to provide general education. Special education is not special education only. So if they're in a special education classroom and they have no access to the general education curriculum, that's a violation of the law. So if you know the law and you're letting your district know you know, and you say, I really think having access to that general education curriculum every day in the inclusive setting with support is, more, is the appropriate setting for the child. You can see how the language, you know, where we keep using the same language. So there is something called the general education test, which Monica asked me to point, point out to you. So this is kind of a four-pronged test that, that districts use. I'm not exactly sure where in the law this lives. So you're looking at, are there educational benefits to the child in the classroom? Are there non-academic benefits of that interaction? with the, the non-disabled peers, the impact of the student on the teacher and other children, this is part of the gen ed test, and then the cost. So what happens is, and that's in red and, and in italics, because in most parts of the IEP process, you cannot talk about money. You talk about the needs of the child, and it doesn't matter what it costs. They're obligated to provide it. They don't always have the money to do it, and that's another matter. In this case, if the cost of educating the child in the gen ed setting is so prohibitive and there is an uh, a appropriate setting for the child that is not does not include a paraprofessional, they can insist on placing the child there. But then we go back to what's appropriate. So if their appropriate setting without a one-to-one -one aid is a special day class with seven children with severe behavioral issues who are screaming and throwing furniture off up, across the room and you're hyper auditory sensitive, sensory, cognitively typical child with a visual impairment is gonna go in there. That, would that be appropriate? No, it serves the district because it's a small class size. They already have an, a para and a teacher in there. It works for them, but we're still always going back to what's appropriate for the child. So you need to know about this, but, and they can mention cost in this one instance. Any other time they talk about money in your IEP, you're saying, we're not talking about that. We're talking about what's appropriate for my child based on her unique needs. All right, so how to write it in the IEP. How much time does your child need support? In what settings? At what times? With what activities? Write it all out. Write a schedule. If they say there's no room in the IEP, oh, it's okay, you can add it as an addendum. Would you like me to write it for you? Parent addendums are required to be included in the IEP if it's requested. Um, what happens if the dedicated para is sick? So in my son's case, and all of our kids, you're talking about such a level of complexity. There are doctors that don't understand our kids, right? So if the para is sick, I don't want a substitute para. I want another trained para. So I required the school district to provide two additional people, all three of them, the, one to, the dedicated one-to-one, -one, the, the relief para was what we called the person that filled in at lunch and recess, and the third para all had the same training. So that if dedicated para is sick, relief para becomes the dedicated para, backup para becomes the relief para. Worst case scenario, two are sick, the last para is now the dedicated para, and there may be a sub for lunch and recess but I also had it written in the IEP that in that event, the parent will be notified. So I had the option, if my kid was having an off day or week, or I knew they were going on a field trip, to say, you know what, no, we're not going. We're not gonna do that, I could opt out. Um, training, what is the training? So it's not just training is needed. Very specific, what is the training? And then what are the qualifications that your child specifically requires? You can request at any time information regarding the qualifications of any teacher um, and you can also uh, ask for uh, information about the services provided by paraprofessionals. You technically cannot ask for qualifica para qualifications generally, but again, if it's unique, it meets your unique needs for the para to have specific training, yet you, you do have the right to know. So a good para is good at all these things, implementing the lessons, assessing the student needs, maintaining a safe learning environment, exercising good judgment, providing the right support, participating in training, following policies, using good judgment, and building and maintaining effective communication. These are basic job skills, right? So this is like the starting point. So we earlier I showed you kind of what the base requirements were. They have a high school diploma or two years of college, et cetera. And this, 
and everything else that your kid needs. It's a lot. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to pause for a minute. Um, I'm just going to tell you quickly, actually, the, two, the pair of problems, there's two. The teacher doesn't know their role. And there's a lot of a, a big role for paras have to have to work with uh, teachers have to work with the paras. They have to provide that instruction. They have to go provide training. They have to have a relationship. Teachers often, often don't know that they have that responsibility. And principals also often don't know their role, their obligation for paraprofessionals and what they need to be doing. So I'm not going to spend time on this because I want to make sure we have a lot of time for Q&A and get Courtney to come up here and join us. Um, so yeah, we're just going to move on to Q&A now. So yeah, that's it. You guys have any questions? Come on up so we're together. And maybe we could use the mic for the mm -hmm. questions in the audience. There's one in the back of the room there. I know, I'm sorry. That's, that's your special ed teacher. So that's the special yeah. Teacher. So my son started out in, in inclu full inclusion. Yeah. The resource teacher is what it was called at our school, but it's the same thing, was responsible for the special SDI, the specially designed instruction, mm -hmm. looking at the classroom curriculum and, and adapting or modifying the curriculum as needed and making sure that those SDIs were provided. That was done by the resource teacher, who was also his case manager. She wasn't present in the classroom all day, every day, but she was still responsible for designing that curriculum supervising the para. She didn't know that at the time, but um, does that answer the question? Is that what you're th getting at? Yeah, and then, so knowing that that's sort of her role and knowing, like she has said, you know, I'm gonna spend an hour or two a day with him in the classroom. My concern is like the rest of the day when he's one of 20 kids and he's used to being like a one to three ratio. And again, things like toileting or using his left hand, which has been effective so do you have a dedicated para for him? No. Okay, so you need one. But you just mentioned already five things that he needs help with, yeah. and I haven't talked to you for 30 seconds, right? Yeah. So go home, make your list okay. of all the ways. Every Think about it from when you wake up in the morning mm -hmm. until you go to bed at night, and do this for the next couple weeks, and just every time you think of something, put it on your iPhone. You know, hey, Siri. Oh, now it's going to start recording me. Um, and, and start adding it. You will find you're going to have a list of 30 to 60 things then you go into your, you call an IEP meeting. By the way, IEP meetings don't happen once a year, they happen whenever you call them. The school district is obligated to hold an IEP meeting within 30 days of parent request, always. And if there's a safety concern where you feel like you can't send your child to school because there's no paraprofessional support and you feel it's imperative, you can say, I can't send my kid to school because there's no para. You'll have an IEP meeting within a day or two because the school district loses funding every time a special ed student does not attend by the order of about hundreds of dollars a day. So that gets them to sit up and listen. But you need to sit down and say, who's going to help him with cutting? Who's going to help him go to the bathroom? Who? And then you're, now you, you see how you're building the case for that paraprofessional. So while assessments, are, I feel, are critical and important, you can do it as a parent. Depends on your district. If you get pushback, then you're requesting that FBA. You're requesting that vision and mobility assessment. You're requesting a PT assessment to see how does he manage track. Can he pull his pants up? Can he button them? Can, can he wipe his bottom? I mean, all those things are really important, especially for the younger kids. Mm -hmm. So. Because the IEP said he had paraprofessional support and you thought you got it all the time. <laughs> it's the classroom aid. It was fine. Yeah. But he may be the only special needs kid in his class. And I know just having had a few IEP meetings that they, they're hesitant to like dedicate that money and yeah, resources. Yeah, of course. 
But do they, is there a way that they share them? And Depends. Them, like they don't always need anything. Depends on what your assessments say and what are the unique needs of the child. I would argue that in preschool and younger grades, when your kid falls down, it's not very far. When they're 10 years old and they fall down, they trip over something or they're running across the yard and they fall down and hit their head on concrete, it's an issue. So you focus on safety, you focus on access, and, and I've said this in the previous presentation, I probably haven't said it here yet. Um, IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, it's very unwieldy, which is why I don't say the whole thing very often. That's the law that governs all of this. Requires that schools provide um, progress for the child in academics, social, emotional, and functional. It's not just academic. So you, those are all the areas that your child has. And if they're not achieving independence in those areas, which is the ultimate goal of education, they might require para support and training. So the para might be there to help with toileting and then they're getting PT or OT to help with all those skills, the buckling the pants or whatever, for however many hours a week is needed to, the, then that's how you design the goals, et cetera. So it's a multi-layered, but you, you know, I feel like paras, especially the, when our kids are starting school, especially if the surgeries are fairly recent, you really want that dedicated support initially. Schools also, they might not want to dedicate the resources um, they never want to dedicate the resources. They like things that are temporary. So oftentimes when I come up against a school district that's really pushing back about a para, I say, look, this kid had brain surgery six months ago. You'd hate to have her fall and have like a really serious brain injury that damages the other side. Why don't you give us a para for six months and then we'll reassess and see how she's doing. What do you think, what's gonna be different in six months? You and I know the child's not gonna recover their vision, their motor function, their auditory function, their social skills, their sensory issues in six months. So when you reevaluate in six months, the team is gonna say, this kid needs a para. Do you get the idea? I want you to comment on multiple paras in the room and your role as a dedicated aide and how, um, how it worked when another para was present and was there ever a time where you were put in a position where you were supposed to be watching other kids or where other paras were saying, I don't know, just tell me a little bit about the dynamic there if you can. Um, well, I was the only dedicated in the room, but it was interesting because I was in the room with a shared para. And so if the teachers had to step out and a para was asked to sub, it was never me, it was like the shared para. So that's really watch for the difference between <laughs> dedicated and shared and beware of those differences. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so that's the question. When you're in the IEP meeting, you're asking your team, is this a dedicated para or a shared para? What's the ratio? How many kids will that para be serving? How many other children with disabilities are in the room? They might say, oh, that's confidential. It's not. I need to know what the ratio of support is going to be for my child. I have seen IEPs where it says one to two dedicated para, where there's one para for two kids. If that's appropriate and you feel like that's going to work, and it happens to be your kid's BFF from down the street, Great, right? It's a win-win. I'm not saying you don't ever do that, but you need to know and it needs to be very clearly spelled out in the IEP. Did that answer? Okay, we have another question here. And then back here, I think. Uh, when you're starting, and I think every one of us has a special problem, um, don't you think that, the, do you think that having a pre, uh, an, um, an IEP conference prior to the school year starting is appropriate. If you can bring all of your information slash ammunition with you so that you know what you need to do on your side, yeah. plus some advocates for you, with yeah. you, Absolutely. that are still, yeah. that are right on to yeah. you. So again, I mean, that's outside of the bounds of this talk, but I would argue, um, if, if you could have a meeting with the school team before school started, that would be great. It never happens. It's not going to happen because teachers are required to be at the school three days before. They need time to set up their classroom and they have at least one day of professional development that they're committed to. I find it very, very hard to get school teams to agree to have any meetings before school starts. It depends on the district. There are some wonderful districts out there. There are sometimes the parent already has a personal relationship with the person who's gonna be their child's special ed, ed teacher because they live on the same block. So it's not, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. It's worth asking. What I often see is they say, well, we will meet within the first week of the school year. Write it in the IEP. There will be an IEP team meeting with X participants by 
seven days into school, five days, whatever it is. And then if, if they haven't worked out the paraprofessional and you feel this conversation hasn't happened, you can say, that's fine, but I'm not going to be able to send my kid to school until we have this meeting because it's not spelled out. Has the child, ha does the child have an IEP at all? child has a, an IEP starting first, into first grade, but that would be the tune for next year then. But does, so currently the child has an IEP? Evidently, yes. Okay, and the team has not met to discuss the child as a team. How was the IEP yeah. the last day of last school year? And they rushed the parent through it and they told them they had to sign or they wouldn't be able to have a place in school and they made threats and blah, blah, blah. never signed the IEP in the meeting, by the way. Don't let them bully you. Polite but firm is what I always say. So that's a, this is like a whole other topic about the procedural stuff, and I'm happy to answer it offline, but I want to make sure we do. we got about five more minutes, and I still have Lillian's question to answer. I'm going to let you ask, then I'm going to answer the question about paras attending, and I want to say one thing about why paras are bad. Poor Courtney. Okay, there's a question back there. Back, woman in the back of the room had her hand up. Yeah, so Sorry. Mm -hmm. So what, what, how can we, or what I guess is their um, responsibility in terms of communicating with us, training that we give, um, us being able to say, hey, you know, don't just stand in the corner for safety, be more hands-on, reinforce. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So again, the law says that they have to provide specially designed instruction to meet the unique needs of the child. So it kind of goes to Lillian's question, so I'm going to answer Lillian's question and then come back to kind of what you're talking about. So I have seen teams where they say the para cannot attend the IEP. Um, I thought I had a slide in here about it, but I don't. But there is a place in the law that says if there is a person who has knowledge about your child, they are required to attend the IEP, even, even though they're not listed as IEP team participants under the law. If you go to um, Parent Center Hub is one of my favorite websites, just look up uh, required participants for IEP and you'll see who has to be there. Um, paras are not on that list, but it does say any per a person of knowledge about the child. If that person can't attend because they're a union or they're a contracted person, they need to provide um, a document describing like present levels of the child or whatever information that one is shared, and then they need to be debriefed on what was the decisions that were made in the meeting afterwards. The communication has to happen. Um, and you want to use language like, I don't want to, to limit access to FAPE, which is free and appropriate public education. So everything's an acronym in special ed, I'm sorry. But FAPE is like the what you want. FAPE is the, is, is the, you know, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's your FAPE. So, your child is not accessing FAPE if there isn't, if you don't know what's happening with the para and the teacher, you, you know, sometimes you have to do that where you're in the meeting and you say, well, what is the para doing at X and such time? And the teacher's like, I don't know, because at that time I'm over in centers. Right there, you've got, well, then it, I think it, this indicates that the para needs to be here or we need to be, can we hold another meeting next week? I'll let you get time to go and get the report from the para and we'll meet next week and discuss it again. Oh, another meeting. They already don't like that, right? So you get the idea. All of this is a process. I don't want to set you guys up for a combative relationship with the school, but you have to know what your rights are, and it all comes down to the unique needs of your child. So if they're meeting the unique needs, then it's a different scenario. For the paras attending the meeting, when we had, um, my son had a para for five years in inclusion and gen ed, we, he did attend most of the IEP meetings. We had a lot of IEP meetings. We, when he was in early grades, we had 10 or 12 IEP meetings a year. Remember, you can call an IEP meeting at any time. If you run out of time, like the meeting, that you get a half an hour to discuss one of our kids, you saw the list of comprehensive evaluations. Do, is a half an hour enough time to, we don't even scratch the tip of, so you have to call another meeting. So then before the meeting ends, let's look at our calendars and go to the next meeting. So I am not gonna make the para come to 12 meetings. The para was willing to attend. I asked him to come to the meetings that I thought were most relevant. I worked it out with the principal. I said, can we have it be during Diego's breaks? And then Diego got a really nice Amazon or Whole Foods gift card that week because he was then going to get, not get paid for that hour, right? Because he's contracted six hours during the school day and we have a two-hour meeting after school. I can't pay him, but he gets nice thank you cards, 
right? I'm not saying, you know, you figure it out. There's ways to do it. But the school is obligated to make sure that the needs of the child are met. And if there's a communication issue that's preventing that, I think that you have an argument to say, this isn't working. How can we make this work better? Um, you had a question too, right? I'll defer. And I want to say, OK. The one thing I want to say is, what, why are paras bad? Can anyone think of what, what would be the bad reason for a para? What do you think? Yeah, they overcompensate. Overcompensate. What else? Stigma. What else? Socially isolating. Socially isolating. Okay. So Courtney happens to be the stellar example of the para you would want. She's ABA trained. She's floor time trained. She worked with the family for three years before she became the para. She's brilliant. She's gorgeous. She's got it all, right? <laughs> this is like, this is the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This, this is not what most paras present as in terms of their skills and their ability and whatnot. And I do feel that oftentimes, and schools will say the para is going to get in the way. And I, dis I agree and disagree. So again, it goes back to what's the need of the child and what is the intent? Why are you putting the child in inclusion? What is your goal? Is your goal for your child to have social skills, right? You're not really caring. It's early grades. I'm not so worried about education so much. I can do some reading programs at home. I really want my ch child to make friends. Is the para trained in providing social skills support for that kid? If not, then it might be a problem, right? And, and what happens when it's a problem is that then you're looking at a different setting, perhaps. My son ended up in a non-public school, which is a private school funded at district expense that's smaller. They have a social skills curriculum across all grades that every single staff person in the school is trained on, not just the teachers, right? Everyone down to the bus drivers is trained on the social skills curriculum. Class sizes were tiny. He didn't need a para because the school was so small. And he was able to have all this support. So sometimes you're looking at what are the options. And none of us want to pull our kids out of, none of our, I, I never want, I don't want to say none of us. I don't want to generalize. I never wanted to pull my kid out of public school. I felt my son was entitled to go to the neighborhood public school, and that's where he was going, and that was what was right and fair. Was it good? Not always, right? And so we sacrificed a lot to have him in gen ed. When he got into the NPS, he didn't need a para because he was able to access the environment. It was all level, and they had um, an elevator. He, had, uh, so he did have someone go with him on the elevator initially when he first started. He had more academic interventions, reading interventions that were appropriate, the social skills curriculum. And he was able to make friends. And yes, all the kids there had disabilities, which is considered a more exclusive. We talked about least restrictive environment. The district will say, well, that's a more restrictive environment. Monica Jones's response to that is, what is more restrictive than the child not knowing how to read and not having any friends? So when you talk about LRE, it goes both ways, right? Um, so sometimes having a para is bad. These are really big weighty issues that we have to think about for our kids. And our kids are really complicated. There is no easy, I wish I could say there was an easy answer. And if you just do X, Y, and Z, you'll get it and it'll be perfect. It's not, it's just not easy. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've, I, you know, it, I've seen parents on both sides. I've seen parents that say my kid will never go to the neighborhood public school. And then there were parents like me that it had to happen. Everything in between, you have to just kind of weigh what the, what the appropriate um, setting is for your child. And para professional in, is setting because the setting for the child is gen ed, but with that para professional support, it does change the setting, the educational setting for the child. There's a question there, and I'm going to make that the last one because I have another presentation in 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, right there. Sorry, in the back. <clears throat> Okay. Okay. So a non-public school, private school, I'm going to really quickly breeze through, but I'm happy to talk about this more offline. A non-public school is a, is a private school that is certified by the state to serve kids with IEPs, and a child can be placed via their IEP in that school. So let's say your public school only had one program that they felt fit your child, and it wasn't gen ed. It was an SDC with kids that weren't it just wasn't the right fit for whatever reason, and they agreed. But they had no school in their district that would meet your child's needs. But there was this NPS school, 30 minutes bus ride away, whatever. I think within an hour is what the law considers acceptable, unfortunately, on the bus ride. Just know that. My son loves riding the bus, by the way. It's one of the highlights of his day. Uh, talk about social skills. You know, they spend the whole time, you know, talking and hanging out and having fun. And you can get a para to go on the bus. You can get a nurse to go on the bus. You can get a nurse and a para to go on the bus. Again, what are the unique needs of your child? OK, so option A is 
school district placement. Option B is you got an NPS in the district that the district is willing to place into. What if there's no appropriate placement in the district and there's no NPS within 100 miles of your house, but there's a private school down the road that is would be great? Then you go to the district and say, this is FAPE. This, would, this school could provide FAPE for my child. I want you to pay for it. It is different, and you would have to negotiate with the school district attorneys for a settlement and it would be outside of the IEP, and you have to revisit it every two years. But I have seen it happen outside of a um, lawsuit. So when I say settlement, it means you're sitting down with a school district attorney, and they're saying, we're going to give this to you for two years. They write up an agreement, you sign it, and you come back to the table two years later. Is the school responsible for implementing the IEP? It depends on the school. So you would want to choose a school, I would think, that's going to meet all of your child's needs. If the needs are well defined in the IEP, then yes, you'd want them to be implementing the IEP. If the IEP is terrible and the school is great, forget the IEP, right? So again, it's very specific to what your child needs. Now imagine you have none of the options. Imagine the school district is terrible, there's no placement meets your child's needs, there's no NPS or a private school within 100 miles of your house, then what? The school district still has to provide a free and appropriate public education. What is that going to look like? Then you might be thinking outside the box. You might be asking for home instruction for part of the day. You might be asking, saying, look, my kid can go to gen ed for maybe three hours a day, but that classroom is really chaotic. No, there's no way they're going to last all day, and they're not going to learn anything in that environment. So how about three hours a day with a para, and then two hours in the afternoon of direct instruction and reading and math, right? So you have to start thinking creatively. It depends on where you live and what your district has available, what the resources are. I'm going to end there because uh, we're out of time. I have another presentation now, but at 5 o'clock, I'll be free to answer more questions, and I will leave some cards out. You can take my card. And thank you so much. Thanks, Courtney.